and I open the door and then he literally pulls the trigger five times uh, pointed towards my leg. So it's actually very discreet. And most of the time, the nice part is people, since so many people around the world have GoPros, they just think like I'm another Joe Schmo, like filming my little vacation. And they don't actually realize that I'm filming for like a big YouTube series that I'm making. Yes, the whole podcast where he was talking about you and like how he wants to have a child with you in the future <laughs> and stuff like that. <laughs> <laughs> You hear that? She said, Yeah, Borne. Yeah, Borne. Habibi. Check it out. Episode 425 of episode of A Spread the Show. Traveling around the world. We got me in Los Angeles, 5 30 in the morning. Saeed in the UK, whatever time. And uh, I guess Mac Candy from World Nomad. Uh, uh, YouTube travel vlogger, full time traveler. What? <laughs> is this a prank or is this real? We'll uh, find out today. And he maybe will teach us some things about making money while traveling. How's it going? Oh, it's going great. It's a little bit later in the day than uh, it is over there in Los Angeles. It's uh, 4.45 <laughs> p.m. over here in Oman. And uh, yeah, I'm really excited to uh, join you guys on the podcast. We're going to have some fun talking a whole bunch of things related to travel and whatever else these uh, conversations turn into. So I'm excited. Oh, <laughs> all right. Sounds <laughs> good. So um, what's your favorite place you've been to so far? Oh, that's that's the usual first question I get. <laughs> so favorite place, you know, I will first answer this in the most complex way that the more places you go, the harder it becomes to pick a favorite place. And the reason why I'm explaining this is because after you've been to quite a few countries, you start having favorites for like most beautiful landscapes, most like technologically advanced, most culturally inviting. And I would say like, you know, People could probably guess my favorite country. I'm a bit biased now, but uh, <laughs> the one that had the most impact on me was like the first Middle Eastern country where I experienced like the incredible hospitality you get in this part of the world was in Lebanon. I, I Habibi Allah. <laughs> Habibi Allah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like I said, you guys could have guessed that one. And I'm not being biased. I'm, I'm being honest here, uh, okay. especially because... Uh, uh Sahabte is Min Lebanon, so my girlfriend. Yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah. Uh, yeah. So I mean, Lebanon, while it's in a very rough shape it, with the currency crisis, with the things going on with the government, not, not to get too deep into those side of things, it's a very mm. beautiful country, very yeah. beautifully spirited people. And it had such an amazing impact on me in terms of like arriving to a country in this state. And, you know, the let's say the, the Lebanese lira had a 95 percent devaluation in two years when I arrived in July 2021. Yet the first day I'm getting there, people are still offering to pay for my meals and showing me around and giving me this incredible Lebanese hospitality, despite some of the conditions. And that was just like such an incredible moment. And for me, when I travel, like the one of the most important things for me to have an incredible experience is the interactions I have with the people. When I first started traveling, I was like, okay, let's see who can get the coolest Instagram photo, right? Like, you know, beautiful <laughs> mountains, landscapes, clear yeah. bu blue water, kind of what people envision with a vacation. But then when I became more of a travel vlogger and I got into traveling and like really understanding the world and crushing stereotypes that you're born into i started to really be drawn into the the cultural side just the interactions i have with people and how how that happens and so lebanon was just such an incredible experience for me and now i've been exploring all over the middle east and it's my favorite part of the world to explore for sure now and uh is that, is that where you <laughs> is that where you met your girlfriend you met her in lebanon or somewhere yep else? We so I went there last July. We were going, uh, my friends Luke and I, another travel vlogger, uh, Australian travel vlogger. We had planned a trip to Lebanon, we were going for two weeks, and then we had arrived about five days in. We met a really nice guy named Fuad who gave us like the epitome of Lebanese hospitality, <laughs> and that's kind of like where our love for Lebanon started. Basically, two weeks turned into two months. And while I was there, cool. I saw my content having such a strong impact not only on foreign people considering visiting Lebanon, but also a lot of the Lebanese people told me like, hey, you know, we're in our darkest days right now. And you're basically looking at Lebanon in such a positive way that it gave them it gave them a lot of uh, excitement about their country. And so kind of all of that, it, it motivated me to want to make more and more content. So I extended those two weeks into two months. And during that time, I had probably made like 80 TikTok videos. 
And um, my girlfriend kept seeing them uh, at the time, not my girlfriend. And she was just like, what is this American guy doing in Lebanon in the middle of the crisis in July 2021? So she was like, hey, let's meet for coffee. We met for coffee in the mountains of Biblos. And uh, yeah, we, like a 30 minute coffee date turned into six hours. And uh, yeah, now we're we're doing some traveling again. She's like <laughs> about uh, maybe 50 meters behind me or three, 150 feet hour. behind me. <laughs> Somewhere back there. <laughs> Show us a hob day. <laughs> oh but, um, but that's so cool man that she made the first move like because like you know and <laughs> most of the time we'd hear like men have to do like the first move and that's how it goes with dating and stuff like that yeah, but seriously she, yeah when uh, i feel like when women make the first move it's it's just like it's as if it's meant to be somehow yeah. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. I mean, that's, I couldn't agree more because I remember like after I had nice met one. her, like I was looking at Instagram and of course, you know, like these algorithms are like programmed to like read our brains. And I read something like 80% of relationships where the girl reaches out to the guy first always work out. And so I was like, okay, well, that's a good sign. <laughs> that's statistics for you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, Mac, you're from America originally, the Midwest. What? That's right. <laughs> for me, it's like, you know, when I'm traveling to Le Lebanon, I'm Lebanese, but if I'm traveling to uh, Pakistan or India or Arabia, or, I feel like there's a little bit of a danger factor. Um, have you ever been in a dangerous situation? Yes, I have been in a couple of dangerous situations, but they weren't as dangerous, but they sound very dangerous. And let me explain what this what exactly I mean by this. So I was in actually one year ago, almost probably to this date. And it could be exactly 365 days ago from right now, actually, because I was right after I left Lebanon after those two months, I traveled over to Iraq and I had a really nice time there. I explored uh, the northern part, Kurdistan, or some define it as Kurdistan, some define it as greater Iraq. But uh, I explored all over there, had an incredible time with my uh, friend Luke and I, and then we flew down to Baghdad and uh, we spent a couple of days there in Baghdad, Iraq. I really enjoyed it, met a lot of great people and uh, basically crushed a lot of stereotypes that uh, surround, you know, a place that faced war for many, many years, right, in the recent history. And then we, so we had a really nice time there. Uh, there was a lot of military there, so it feels like it's dangerous, but you never actually really run into any dangers. And that was that was our experience. And so we're like, OK, we've got this. And we took an overnight train over to from Baghdad down to Basra, the southern part of Iraq. And when we were arriving to the train station, we were filming. And let me just first of all say before I even tell this story that like it was overall a really great experience. But if you don't understand kind of Iraqi humor, uh, it'll <laughs> the heck out. <laughs> you know let's put it that way because whenever i tell my friends this especially back in the u.s they're like have you gone crazy bro and i'm like uh maybe a little bit <laughs> but um so so me and my friend luke arrived to the uh, baghdad train station and we're of course doing what we all we're always doing we're walking around with our cameras and filming everything i mean that's our type of vlogs is we're not trying to make some cinematic show we're literally just like talking to someone asking where we can find hamud nana argele or trying to go to a market and buy something, you know? So whatever it might be. And for those English speakers, Hamoud Nana Argeli is lemon and mint uh, shisha. And so, you know, <laughs> we we arrived to this uh, train station and there's like the Iraqi military police there. And they're wondering, they're questioning us. And at this time, I didn't speak any Arabic. I could probably say marhaba if, on, a, on a good day. And so uh, we're talking to them. Oh, we're YouTubers. We're just making content. And they were really nice. They invited us for a meal before our train. And then they gave us like this huge, like 10 person military escort, all with like AK 47s over to the train. Not because there was any risk. I think they were just showing it as a gesture of kindness. And so, you know, like five, six hours go by, we hop on the train and uh, the train, I think is maybe a nine or 10 hour train ride. We're passed off to a different set of Iraqi military officials. And so at this point, they are, I mean, the important part to know here, if I could visually show you. So Luke and I both happen to be wearing green army shirts. Uh, we, we don't own that many clothes because we travel lightly. And we, and I had a haircut that literally looked like a Marine's haircut. I mean, I, we, I look back at this photo and I'm like, no wonder why we look suspicious, but like, we have no affiliation to any army or anything like that. But I think, uh, 
you know, people thought otherwise, let's say. So we were on this, uh, we were on this train and, um, the military officers, uh, offered us some tea and they were just very interested in us. They invite us into the captain's, uh, corridor, small little room. And, you know, they were chatting with us, joking around. It felt kind of odd because uh, some of the viewers commented later on this YouTube video that like, it seemed like people were coming in to see us and like, almost like an exhibit, like looking at us, like, Oh, you know, look at these guys. What are they doing here? Just random people on the train. It's still, I don't really know, but they, you could tell they were suspicious. So they started asking us, Oh, are you CIA? Are you, um, you know, <laughs> because, you know, like we have, we have an Australian here and then we have me and we're traveling on our own. We're filming everything. We're both looking like we're, you know, in the army or something. And so don't they have YouTube? <laughs> yeah yeah exactly you show them like, your oh. youtube channel <laughs> exactly. and, that, so they and that's what we were doing you know they but literally <laughs> thought like you were operatives like going around the rock just like filming <laughs> stuff <laughs> yeah, oh exactly <laughs> and in hindsight we probably looked like it because you know you, you don't get that many tourists right now in iraq and that's mm. changing it is definitely changing and you know the stereotypes and things of like is it safe to go are, are changing which is amazing yeah but where so just to give you an idea of what it was like in this uh, cabin it was a small little cabin with maybe three seats on a bench and then there were some cupboards and then they had a small little teapot and um there was probably five or six of us in there that, you know everyone's smoking cigarettes so it's very cloudy and the train is just rocking back and forth and here and there the uh the cupboard would fly open and guess what was in there just a bunch of ak-47 so like those things would come tumbling out and we'd be like trying to close it it's just you know just you know just one of these things that one of these experiences where everything happening around us was insane but like for some of these moments we also weren't recording because that's going to make it even look more suspicious we were just trying to record what it's like taking an overnight sleeper train from baghdad to basra and not what it's like to be kind of interrogated by military officials so um, we're almost we're almost to basically the climax of this story, but then they started. Uh, they so they saw that I have, and you guys, I don't know if the uh, uh, listeners okay. on the podcast can see this, but I have a cedars tree, which is the um, national emblem of Lebanon. Uh, Sahabte, my girlfriend, got it for me uh, basically a year ago, and I've been wearing it since. So they they saw that and they were like, Lebanon. I was like, eh, you know, <laughs> a big yes, like oh, they recognize this, and then so then they started showing me. Uh, photos of controversial political parties oh, uh, and so <laughs> i knew exactly who they were showing me but i was like i need to answer this question no because then they're really going to get suspicious of me when i just know it because i spent a lot of time in lebanon so i was like no no halas, i don't know uh, uh stop i don't know uh, any of that okay fast forward everything was fine we go back into our train cabins and we have a first class one. It's maybe 20 US dollars to travel from uh, Basra, sorry, Baghdad down to Basra in the first class cabin. And so now another three hours goes by. The doors are closed. They lock, but there's still enough, like probably mm, four centimeters or one and a half inches uh, that if even if it's locked, someone can still open it. So at this point, I'm actually rebooking a flight to go from instead of Basra back to Baghdad, I was going to go Basra straight to Beirut because I was going to go back for like two weeks or something. So I'm on the phone trying to change my ticket while I'm on my laptop, probably editing Luke's next to me editing as well. And all of a sudden the Iraqi military officer comes up to the door and he's banging on the door. And once again, there's a language barrier. He only speaks Arabic uh, and we only speak English. And so we were communicating earlier in the general's cabin through Google Translate basically showing each other uh, the phones. So he's knocking on the door and I'm in the middle of trying to change this. So I'm like, hold on, hold on. I am, uh, I'm trying to change my flight ticket. But of course he has no idea. He just sees now two guys who he's already suspicious of on their laptops at midnight <laughs> on the phone. And so then he, he all of a sudden pulls out his pistol and sticks it right through the hole. And I'm like, whoa, 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 bro. Hold on, hold on. And uh, he drops the clip and I open the door and then he literally pulls the trigger five times uh, pointed towards my leg. And I'm like, I'm yelling. I'm like, if there was a bullet still stuck in the chamber, I would have a hole in my leg right now. And then the guy just starts laughing. <laughs> one for him because my thought I was about to get like shot. And oh uh, my god! And, and so yeah, the, the Iraqi police officer is just laughing, and he thinks it's all fun and games. But it was a pretty scary moment, uh, to say the least. I 
I mean, <laughs> I guess the, the the military sense of humor is, uh, yeah, it's pretty rare. <laughs> There's only a few yeah. things that's gonna make them laugh, other than. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Oh my god! Other, other than pulling out a pistol on a uh, an American on a train down to uh, Basra, so it was, it was a funny moment. But I would do it again. Let's put it that way. <laughs> <laughs> oh shit, yeah, man. So, what what other experiences have you had where, let's say, not dangerous, but more of like thriller, more ex like excitement? Excitement. Like there was a lot of adrenaline rushing through you. Let me think about this one for one quick second here. Mm -hmm. uh, for me, when I uh, I traveled to Turkey, and then I went with well, I was actually taking a layover to Lebanon from the U.S. to, and I was in Turkey. I had a skateboard on me, and the Turkish police stopped me. They were like, "Give me the skateboard." And I was like, no, it's my skateboard. It was like an expensive skateboard. It was mine. Yeah. I bought it. And I was like, sorry, it's mine. I'm taking it with me. And then the police was like, you arrested. And I was like, what? He's like, come with me to prison. I'm like, you can have the skateboard. I just want to go home right now. Wow. <laughs> Literally that. Yeah. And then ever since then, I'm like, you know, nothing against Turkish people and stuff like that. But it's like, it scares me. It shook me to my core, you know. Oh, so, that is um, terrifying. Yeah, that was the closest I've ever been to being arrested. And being arrested in Turkey, oh my God, I would, <laughs> that would have been so scary. Yeah. Yeah, I can imagine. <laughs> and and that, that, so speaking of a story of like nearly getting jailed for an unfair reason, I did have one moment like that when I was in Playa del Carmen in Mexico. This mm -hmm. was last May. So my friend Cal and I, we had just left the club. And, you know, we had had a couple drinks and we're walking down the road. Uh, my buddy Cal had lit up a cigarette. And then there was some guy in this dark alleyway that was like, hey, can I get one? And so, of course, you know, it's kind of like the uh, uh, unwritten rule. You know, if someone else asks you for one when you're out on a night out, you share a cigarette. So my friend Cal <laughs> had uh, shared him a cigarette. And then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, two, and I don't know if you've ever seen like the Mexico police vehicles, they just look like they're about to bust like a drug cartel. It's exactly what you see in the movies. <laughs> they have these pickup trucks. Guys have black masks on and, you know, like they're, they're coming in with big, big assault rifles. And so all of a sudden they like come around the corner and they jump out. And this is like maybe, I don't know, two, three, four a.m., something like really late in the night. And they think they're busting us. Uh, and so like they come and surround us. They're like, uh, and, you know, in some broken English, they're like, what are you doing? What are you doing? Are you, are you giving him drugs? Are you buying drugs? And we're like, uh, absolutely not. We were just giving him a cigarette. And so keep in mind, we had had a couple of drinks. So we're like, OK, these police officers really think they got us and they're going to realize that they didn't at all. So we probably not the smartest move and I wouldn't ever recommend this to anyone. But I was just like, haha. All right. Well, search me as much as you want. Good luck. I was kind of being a, a bit smart, which once again, oh, I do not no. recommend that. Mac. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, pushing yeah, your definitely limits, man, with the police a, a, a bit out of character in this case but uh <laughs> well, you know we're we are let's put it this way cal and i knew that in mexico and some of these like tourist towns they are known for trying to scam tourists out of money they're not actually going to arrest you but they're going to like force you to pay a bunch of money if you are actually caught with something illegal but obviously we didn't have anything illegal on us and so I'm just like, OK, you can search us. And so when they were searching us, like, you know, this looked like a huge drug bust. And it was just me and my buddy Cal up against the police car. And we're just like laughing, like, keep searching, keep searching. You might find it. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, they, of course, didn't find anything. I was like, told you guys it was just a cigarette. And uh, we, we literally climbed in the back of their uh, police car. We're like, all right, now you guys got to drive us around. And then I think we kind of got them upset. So we hopped out and that was the end of it. <laughs> <laughs> I love yeah. that story, man. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> did, you, did you record it? Did you film it? No, 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 no. So most of my police encounters, I don't record it because usually that's how you set someone off and end up in jail. Mm. So that is that the only time you're not recording when uh, police look? What are the so you're recording a lot of the time, right? Yeah, it's like kind of second nature to you now, right? You just hold the camera and you have it. Um, yeah. When are you not recording? I would say like so. Um, most places they don't want you recording going through customs they don't want you recording mm. going through airport security they don't want you going through recording through military checkpoints and just like uh, random encounters with the police right and so like those i make sure the camera's away 
but I wouldn't say that I would always put my camera away. If I thought there was a sketchy like encounter with a police or military, I would probably keep it recording just so mm. there's evidence of what actually happened. But I would do it undercover. That said, it totally varies on the country. It totally varies on the risk level. Usually I have a pretty good idea on what's allowed and what's not allowed to film. And maybe sometimes I'll push my limits if it's for safety reasons. But <laughs> there's a lot of places you don't want to push your limits. Let's put it that way. Otherwise, you're going to end up in prison and locked up abroad on that Netflix series, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I got away once with uh, recording in a police car when uh, they... So what happened was I got into a a car accident with the wall literally just with the wall <laughs> with the wall, <laughs> with the wall. bro I, I don't know why but for some reason like within 30 minutes a cop car just shows up and they come and my car is like trashed from the front because i was going wow. in, like a yeah this is like right before the finicio hotel there's like a tunnel that comes yeah. out of it i don't know if you know it if you look at the wall, the plates of the wall is, are literally still there on the floor. And you can Bless see the front. Mark. And my, the, uh, the front bumper of my car is still there, by the way. And this is like maybe four <laughs> years ago. Yeah, no one, cleaned shit up. <laughs> no one cleaned anything up. Yeah, I was driving and it's like, it's a bit of a curve. It goes like this. Somehow my car ends up going this way and then bam, right into the wall. Oh, so, no way. Yeah, 30 minutes later, the cops come and there's just like, Okay, yeah, you have to come with us. Well, you have to come with us, and we have to take you to the police station. And I'm like, okay, I'm I'm not gonna resist this. So I get in the <laughs> car, and I'm just like, they're just driving away to the police station. And for some reason, I just felt like filming it. And I was like, oh, this seems interesting. I'm not gonna be in a police car anytime soon again. <laughs> so I was like filming it, and like, me. And it's like, yeah, no filming in the car. I'm like, oh yeah, sorry, sorry. Bro, we get to the police station. I'm just like. I'm I'm like I'm gonna poop myself because I was just like <laughs> worried about what's gonna happen, you know. And the car is still like busted in the in the tunnel. <laughs> they just left it there. And then out of nowhere, they just come back and it's like, "Yo, you want falafel?" I was like, "What? What is this uh, emotional roller coaster you're putting me through?" <laughs> Once you arrest, you arrest me for smashing my car into a wall, now you're just like <laughs> arresting That's me. That's then... hospitality. <laughs> That's hospitality, bro. You go to prison, they give you falafel. Amazing. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> wow. Oh, but yeah, I didn't end up going to jail. They let me go. Oh, you have the footage? Do you still have the footage, Said? Um, I think it's on my Snapchat account. Yeah, I could probably find it. Actually. Send it. We'll overlay it over this clip. <laughs> yeah, we got to see it. <laughs> so um, so when you're like going into all these places, Mac, are you like what kind of are you asking for permission to film or is it like uh, asking for forgiveness from filming? You know what I'm saying? Yeah. yeah. I would say that 98% of the time I ask for forgiveness, not permission, because <laughs> the I probably bend the rules in a lot of cases because there's a lot of rules and laws put in place because there's a lot of people who are abusing those rules and laws and, you know, using video footage and things like that for the wrong reasons. But like for me, for example, I'll, I'll, I'll put an example out. Like I went filming at a mall in Qatar, which you need to have like special permission to film there. Whereas I know that if I was with the ministry of tourism of Qatar and they knew that I was filming a massive vlog series, to shed positive light on their country and they've had a lot of negative press for things that i won't discuss here mm -hmm. they would approve me in a heartbeat right so like i kind of uh, i don't uh, let's let me figure this out i kind of sometimes bend the rules in a place where i know that i'm bringing positive help to them not in a way where like let's say i'm exposing them to any risk like for example they wouldn't want like uh, maybe entrances or things like that to their malls maybe filmed for risk reasons, right? Like any sort of threats or having that publicized on the internet. So I know uh, kind of in advance what rules to bend and what rules not to. And so that's how I kind of make that decision, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. But it seems like it must have been like trial and error for you, right? Because there's no like vlogger's guidebook, right? I don't know how to do this. So like... Um... Exactly. <laughs> I would say like generally... 
when I first started filming, I actually had a really big setup, like a large camera. It was, had a big mm. kind of like tripod on it. I mean, it looked like I was like filming for, you know, a massive news company. But now I actually just film with a GoPro that's got an inconspicuous like microphone cover over the whole thing. So it just is this little like black box with a tripod that I can hold. And so it's actually very discreet. And most of the time, the nice part is people, since so many people around the world have GoPros, they just think like I'm another Joe Schmo, like filming my little vacation. And they don't actually realize that I'm filming for like a big YouTube series that I'm making. And so that kind of like basic camera gear is usually allowed in most places where they don't mind it. And I found that when I'm filming with that, when I'm a bit more discreet, most places they don't really mind. And I mean, I filmed probably in maybe 35, 40 countries out of the 53 that I've been to. And I've never like retroactively had a message knock on wood from like uh, law enforcement from the country saying, hey, you filmed this place and you shouldn't have. And it's mm. because most of my content, I'd say 95 percent of my content's surrounded around like showing off that country's great things to do or people's stories or interactions. But usually once the officials are the ones who would make that decision, see the content, they're not looking to bust me. They're actually usually thanking me for it. I see what you're saying. Fair enough. And now, how do you like go through all this footage, man? Do you, do you edit it yourself, uh, your blogs? Oh, great question. And no, actually, I've got a uh, a team for <laughs> for actually from last September seventh all the way until like mid July. I did daily vlogs on vid- on YouTube that were between twenty to fifty minutes long. And so, <laughs> how that process would work is some days, for example, I would film maybe three, four. And even my most amount of videos I've ever filmed in one day was six vlogs when I was in Pakistan. Started wow. really early in the morning, had six different topics that I covered, and then I filmed all of them. And then basically, at the end of the day, I dump all of that footage onto um, my computer at the end of the day, and then I upload it overnight on Google Drive in the morning. I basically send each one of those folders to my editors, and then they basically send me a 90% completed video video. I review that schedule to post and that's how I manage YouTube. So I basically have a system like that for every platform, but some of them I've like scaled back right now. I just mainly have an editor for YouTube and an editor for Facebook. And then I'm looking for some new positions to try and focus on short form content as well. But to be honest, like uh, setting up systems is, is ultimately the key to managing such a massive amount of content and it varies by vlogger, but I do more high volume large let's say quantity of videos per country i visit whereas some vloggers they'll go to like you know like lost leblanc i think he came to oman where i'm at right now and he made one video that was very cinematic it encompassed like his two weeks here traveling around the country whereas me i'll make one of the hotel i'll make one of flying from the airport i'll make uh you know one trying a local delicacy here one going on a safari etc cetera, etc cetera. and how do you pick the topics that you want to include in your videos so what what are the so I would topics say, that will make you you know make it stand out for you in your in your videos? Yeah, good question. I would say like generally whenever I get to a country, I have like five videos that I'll always make, which would be like flying there, showing the airport experience, kind of just my first impressions and what it's like, like a hotel visit. Some of these that I just mentioned, and maybe trying out like the top foods. And then aside from those, maybe four or five like. Uh, repetitive videos that i have in every country then i'll just have uh like my administrative assistant virtual administrative assistant do some research on top things to do i'll also watch some videos or read up on some content myself and i'll find what are like the most exciting things that kind of fit my adventurous style if it's like a desert safari or a boat trip scuba di- snorkeling scuba diving something like that i'll pick out whatever like that country is well known for and then i'll do that experience through my own eyes or my own lens and that's how i'll basically create the other maybe 10, 15, 20 other videos uh, in the country. And then a lot of the times I like to show if they have public transport, you know, like taking a train somewhere, uh, yeah. taking the city bus, because it's kind of fun to show what it's actually like to do these things. And some of the interactions that you have that are just very, you know, sporadic, spur of the moment type interactions with some of the locals. Yeah. So obviously it sounds like uh, most of your videos are very, you know, planned and organized. Because like you have to encompass all obviously all of your adventures and within the topics that you're sharing and you want to talk about and to get to tell the audience. But what about those moments where you know you're not gonna find them if you research and those hidden gems in those in countries and like small areas that you just stumble upon and you're like, wow, this is this should be known about. Like 
how would you find these kind of places? What kind of, how would you, what would you tell people to, you know, to do so that they could be able to find these kind of places? Great question. I would say generally those, those like really, uh, how would I call them? really unique experiences the ones that are like my best travel memories those usually come from meeting people there so you meet someone uh, in the country and they're really excited to show you around and they take you to some places that just nobody has heard of or maybe they're very hard to travel to and and basically it's almost i don't know if i could think of any stories where i just came across a unique spot it's usually almost always because i met someone and they're like hey i'm going to show you a place that no tourists have ever been to and <laughs> And, and so those, that's when you've got to, you know, as a traveler, you really got to put yourself out there. You got to be okay with meeting people. Even if you're an introvert, that's all right. You know, drink a Red Bull that morning and uh, be an extrovert that day. And, uh, you know, do it, of course, uh, safely because 99% of the world has great people. But of course, sometimes you're going to run into that 1% that aren't going to give you the, the best moments. But, uh, you know, just getting to know people is is truly what i consider the the best way to have these moments a lot of my videos for example in like pakistan are never planned i like when my buddy harry and i went uh, U uh uk vlogger we went last uh november december time frame we would sometimes just walk out of our hotel and be like all right guys welcome back to another video in today's video honestly i don't even know what this video is about yet but you do because this is the title we're just going to go walk the streets and see what happens we'd be walking around and then you know we would be like hey you know speak a little bit of the local language case ho bicep case ho yard how are you uh, bro and then be like hey hey oh you're a vlogger you want to go get some tea boom you know we'll start talking to him we'll be filming the experience then sure enough we'll hop in his car and we'll end up in like you know ended up in a random like uh uh stadium a few hours later with a with a with a pakistani local we met so just kind of these uh, unexpected adventures we also look for them we almost plan to find this if this makes sense like we plan that we want to get lost in something and uh, the nice part is that when you go to you know the south asian middle eastern countries the hospitality is just and the friendliness is just so incredible that you're guaranteed to get these experiences if you just put yourself out there and talk to a couple locals Great advice, Sam. Mac, um, to be honest, I'll be, I'm a little jealous, to be honest. <laughs> let's, let's be frank here. Like, we got to get you on one of these stuff. adventures. I, I'm down. I'm super down. And I'm sure we'll make it happen. But um, I love to travel. It's my favorite thing. As you can see, I've, I've stolen these from all the airplanes I've been on. And, <laughs> and um, Wow, I love one. Yeah, exactly. And um, it's just like, you know, building up that system, Mac. How did you do it? I mean, now you have it. But I'm sure like when you were younger and, you know, and you were starting off, you didn't have all the system. You must have had to edit it yourself. You must have had to do the research yourself and all that. Um, how did you transition from like uh, starting off, you know, travel vlogger to the point you are right now where you're just trying to maximize your content, getting very niche? Yeah, great question. So I'm, I'm 29. I graduated from the university in 2014 and the first five years four and a half years since i graduated i actually went into the corporate world and i worked in washington dc and i got a lot of experience like managing teams and you know basically the teams worked out in the different states uh, all surrounding washington dc and so i had to create a lot of process and procedure use a lot of excel sheets etc cetera, etc cetera. you know a lot of that corporate work type of stuff so i gained a lot of experience there and I had always planned that I wanted to travel. And throughout that time, I was, I was working in the corporate world. I just always wanted to, to travel. And I, I wanted to figure out how it would be possible. So when August 2019 came around, at that point, I had planned for the two years leading up to it, save up some money, pay off my student loans, you know, all that stuff you do as an American straight out of college. Mm -hmm. And so then I took the leap. I had made some YouTube videos prior to that, but you know, until you fully invest yourself, the amount of time and effort, it's, it's hard to balance multiple things at once. That said, it was important to get my feet wet prior to taking the full leap and just like fully quitting my corporate job. But I'm telling you all these details because I gained a lot of experience that later I found how transferable many things are, you know, like being a, a YouTuber and a TikTok or Facebook or Instagram, or I, you know, people call me all of them. I just call myself a content creator. Uh, there's a lot of similarities, you know, to any business you run in the world. Like I just look at it as I, I run 
my own niche media company now, right? Like uh, media companies focus on top breaking news. I just focus on here's my experiences traveling these these uh, countries, and I'm kind of just the reporter in it. But with everything, you're developing a business behind it, right? Like you need to turn it to be sustainable. You need to figure out how to create volume uh, of content. You need to figure out a bunch of different things that you would in any other business. And so uh, during like the three years while I was (laughs) (laughs) during the uh, three years while I was uh, just over three years now that I've been a a full-time content creator, I basically built these systems just through figuring out what things can I outsource that don't actually require me? The number one things that require me are are this, like this moment right now. Nobody can I outsource to do this podcast interview. Nobody can I, can I have outsourced to do the vlogs for me? But what I can outsource is, is someone that can be behind the scenes editing while we're sitting here having this conversation. And so what I figured out is what are all the areas that I can trust with someone else's uh, creative eye and leverage basically finding people around the world. I don't have any employees from the U.S., not because I don't want to hire U.S. employees, but because right now the I can give people jobs in like the Philippines, India, Z- uh, Zimbabwe, uh, Brazil, all over the world. That's a good living for them. And it's still affordable and sustainable for my business as a travel vlogger to have these different business units. But it like with everything you build it slowly over time you don't want to just go and hire like oh i'm gonna have a tiktok editor facebook editor youtube editor because like with any job you know you got to train you got to have them see your creative eye you got to have them see your way of thinking and sometimes you have to hire and fire a few people before you find the right fit and so i started out with like an admin assistant helping me just plan my trips so i could focus a bit more on the videos then once i got a good handle on that then i i brought someone on to help me start editing my youtube videos and that really cleared up a lot of time because then i could just review my youtube videos and before i was spending hours and hours and hours editing them and then once i was able to create that volume then i was able to create more revenue and then i was able to create more open roles in my business and uh, i have like uh it always fluctuates i think i have five five people that work for me because there's recently uh, some 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 uh, changes that I had to make, but um, basically through through this time, you slowly build it up and you bring them on gradually, and so uh, yeah, it's 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 like any other business though is the best way that I relate it to people. Mm-hmm. I see, and it takes time, of course. So the best I'm understanding, it was like a gradual change. The more your YouTube channel, um, exactly, grew, the more you hired people. Exactly, wow. exactly. All right. Who's the next person you're going to hire? What's the next? How, how, do, you, how do you grow from here? <laughs> you know, right now, basically where I'm at is uh, so my so some important points to add is figuring out like what is going to be the best income driving business unit to add on. And so a lot of vloggers are making really, really good uh, ad revenue off of Facebook. A lot of people in the Western world don't realize that in many, many countries in the world, Facebook is still like the leading platform. Videos on Facebook get a massive amount of views and there's so much uh, potential there. So there's a a fair amount of vloggers with a semi-similar niche to me that have really capitalized on the algorithm on Facebook because it's uh, not as saturated as, let's say, TikTok or YouTube or Instagram there's just that much more opportunity to go viral if you figure out the right sauce for it, the right recipe. And so right now I've been on Facebook for a while and I've got a pretty decent following there, but I got to give it a little bit more love. And in order to do that, I need to find the right person who can help me make this possible. And so that's kind of where I'm at is, is trying to free up some more of my time. (laughs) Yeah. We're seeing all the neighbors around here. Uh, (laughs) so yeah basically it's it's figuring out how else i can free up my time so i can be a little bit more strategic on on making facebook videos that are more targeted to go viral but why would you choose facebook over youtube because like so i i've I've been watching a lot of uh, mr beast's podcast whenever he he talks on you know because like he's always sharing tips and ideas about how to become better on youtube and obviously him being the biggest YouTuber at the moment, he, he says it's like the best platform, even for growth and for obviously, uh, and his main thing is like, you just have to make good content, which is something you also do. You know what the people want. But why, why are you saying Facebook over 
YouTube. That's a really, really good point. And I'll answer it in the way that I think is the correct answer. But what? so the difference between like, for example, Mr. Beast or Jake Paul, Logan Paul, these types of like top level uh, YouTubers are people follow them for them and their videos. Hmm mostly right whereas with travel vloggers the challenge one of the biggest challenges we all face is that you you know for example i have three hundred forty five thousand subscribers just on youtube but it's very easy if i go to a new country for my views to just drop and that's because each time you go to a new country it's almost like a new niche mm. whereas you know i might have a lot of um uh followers that i gain from like india pakistan uh lebanon and some of them only like to watch me when I'm discovering their country. But the second I leave their their soil, they don't watch me. They're still subscribed because they support me, but they're not watching the videos because they're not interested in these countries. So that is the, the important point I should mention, being the difference from, let's say, like a Mr. Beast, n almost Netflix level uh, content creator versus a travel vlogger i agree with almost all of his uh tips and strategies and i wouldn't disagree with what he's saying i would just say that with a travel vlogger niche you have to kind of think about what other areas you can cover and with that you know when you're going to some of these other countries uh, around the world like developing nations a lot of them is where you're going to find users using facebook more often and for example, in some of these countries, they really enjoy watching foreign vloggers visit their countries. And that's why, you know, if you post uh, on Facebook and they're predominantly using Facebook, you can capitalize on that market, capitalize on basically repurposing. And let me just mm -hmm. uh, add in this important point. I'm definitely not saying don't focus on YouTube. I still will create all of those videos first as YouTube videos, but then they'll be chopped up into smaller Facebook videos. So it's actually reutilizing that content recycling that content and putting it on facebook and how i do that is for example i might go to a market uh, i think i have this video uh, this chain of videos releasing this week from my facebook editor where i went and bought multiple items throughout uh this market uh that i was in in istanbul now it's probably a 40 minute long youtube video but in there you want your facebook videos to be three to five minutes because people they don't want them as short and quick as let's say a TikTok or a reel, but they don't want them as long as a full YouTube video. They just want something square with captions that's exciting and a little bit longer, but not too long. And so basically this YouTube video now is actually five Facebook videos that I'm able to uh, create it into. And so basically it uh, kills two birds with one stone. You film that YouTube mm -hmm. video and you can still focus on a lot of those Mr. Beast tactics yet you can still capitalize on being a travel vlogger and focusing on the platform that is maybe more prevalent in that country that you're filming in, if that makes sense. Yeah, totally. Um, um, so I just want you to become like Mr. Beast, like uh, traveling <laughs> to India, 10,000 rupees, you know, to last, last to leave, you know, type videos. Yeah. Inshallah. <laughs> Inshallah, one day you get to that point, right? That'd be pretty epic. Uh, <laughs> 20,000 exactly. liras, last to leave this boat. <laughs> yeah, exactly. 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 <laughs> um, yeah. Have you ever thought about, Mr. Reese is brilliant. He does like the international stuff, right? He like gets the voiceovers and he translates yeah. all of his videos. I feel like some of that stuff could work for you, right? Because you're like, uh, you do international stuff. You travel around the world. I mean, wouldn't people watch like your videos in India if it were dubbed in, in uh, Hindi? Uh, do you think yeah. that could have you thought about it or um what do you think really really good question i have thought about it i actually had a guy specifically on india reach out to me and he did a trial like dubbing one of my videos the challenge is is find is is basically i need to find another person who's perfectly fluent in hindi which luckily i do have a, a video editor that works for me that's from india that can basically listen to this dubbed version and make sure it actually sounds good because mm. Pretty much anybody can go and dub a video because they're basically just replacing what you're saying in their own tone. But like if you look at Mr. Beast's uh, videos dubbed, you can tell even not knowing the language when you listen to it like, oh, they're using a similar like, you know, uh, YouTubers, if they're a good YouTuber, they're going to when they're really excited, they're going to, you know, add this extra tone when they're tired, they're going to be like this. They're going to use these different depths of their voices. And so 
what I had an issue with, with the guy that tested out my video with not even knowing any Hindi myself, besides a couple of words is I couldn't feel like this personality change when he was talking about different topics, he couldn't basically replicate my personality while he was dubbing it. And that is the, the challenge is finding that right person at a price point that is affordable. And if I'm honest, I haven't searched too far into it it's crossed my mind because this guy reached out to me but i haven't dug into it more but i think there's a lot of opportunity in it especially in those countries where they really do enjoy watching foreign vloggers let's say in their country but they just um haven't learned english themselves sounds good i'll i'll do it for you in arabic yeah. <laughs> i'll do Yalla. it for you free no problem yalla habibi amshi <laughs> um come in Same. Bro, I gotta, I gotta ask, man. Like now that you have a Lebanese girlfriend and all, how, how the <laughs> fuck are you keeping up with the, the situation between your traveling and like, because she also has her own thing going on. Like she's an, I think she's an artist, right? She, like, yes, musician. Yes. Yeah, yeah, that's a, that's such a good question. I've actually never been asked that question, but yeah. So like, being a singer and being a travel vlogger, they're they're two very very different careers but there's also a lot of similarities you know you're kind of an independent uh person building your own business through your creative uh talents focus and you know perseverance on on achieving things and so right now like uh we're we're honestly still in the exploratory phase of you know how much should she join for traveling versus how much should she be in one one home base and i'm mm -hmm. also in a point in my life where after traveling for three years in order for me to even like get to the next level with making my videos even better on all the platforms, I also need less time on the road and more consistency in my life. So right now, actually, I just got, uh, I rented out a place in Lebanon. So I'm going to be in Lebanon. Uh, Let's go. Oh, damn. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You have a home, uh, finally. After pretty years, soon. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. In, like, in like two weeks, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be saying, <laughs> Anamin uh, Tabarja. <laughs> wow <laughs> nice okay yeah, yeah. okay okay so Congrats. three years being homeless around the world and now you <laughs> find your you found your home in lebanon exactly That's... exactly probably only like you know i mean when i'm around the middle east i'll probably for example travel three weeks out of the month and then one week i'll be in lebanon and um you know she'll going back to the question uh she'll join on some trips and um then sometimes i'll go travel to certain places on my own because she can create music and write songs and you know do some of these things that she does kind of behind the scenes while yeah. we're traveling and it also i think in some of these locations we're in brings her a new level of inspiration or a new way of thinking as well so it really helps in her songwriting but then there's other times when she needs to be close to like let's say her producer or the studio to record vocals where she needs kind of that consistency back in lebanon But uh, yeah, we we've got a pretty good, pretty good level on it. Like all summer I was in Lebanon and we we uh, let's put it this way. We explored some of Lebanon together. I explored sometimes with my friends. She was sometimes in the studio and we had a pretty good mix. And I think we're it's kind of a continuous focus on figuring out a proper balance. But it's definitely doable. Yeah, it's all, it's because like it sounds great that you guys are have this both uh, like an equally uh, mutual growth mentality which is you know synchronized and that's what that's what a lot of people tend to look for like in this situation when they're seeking they're ambitious and they're seeking success personal success and they're very independent so most of so you're probably gonna need the partner that thinks the same way or at least supports your lifestyle because if they don't the relationship is not gonna end up working out that's exactly that's what i observe and the fact that she also ha has her own independent lifestyle means that you guys can do your own thing at the same time but when you do meet up it's like it's a bit more special because it's like you guys take a break from each other and then you come back and it's like you don't have to it, it's not um you know you guys are independent i don't know what's the term used when like you both can like have your own life and then come back together and instead of being exactly. constantly attached to each other. Yeah, totally. Yeah. I think that's like, um, I mean, there's no, there's no lie here that long distance can be pretty tough. I'd say like whenever it's yeah. like more than like 
three, four weeks apart, we're just like, you know, really missing each other. And it can get a bit almost distracting for our careers because we want to see each other. But we're finding out like, you know, two, three weeks away is like a good amount of time because the nice part is when you're away from your significant other for like, you know, a week, two weeks, three weeks, it just adds to that level of, um, let's say, like almost re-enables the honeymoon phase whenever you come back. You're just so, so excited to see each other. So it's kind of like we we continue to get to go through that phase and then, yeah, get so much stuff done while we're away from each other. And then it motivates us to get more and more done. And then when we're together, we're able to like, you know, just be like, all right, let's celebrate our time together. And, and it's a really nice, uh, way of doing it and motivating us to keep going that way. And I will say like, it's, it's such an important thing to like find someone, I mean, especially as a travel vlogger, because I had, I've had previous relationships before and, you know, one I traveled with, you know, great person, I have nothing bad to say about her, but, uh, she was a bit more, um, dependent than independent in terms of like her career goals, you know? And there's nothing wrong with it. Some people prefer to have a boss. Some people don't. But when you're traveling around the world and you don't have a boss, it's a very, it's a very, let's say, um, mm, free dominating, dominating lifestyle. So like a lot of the things were always about me and getting to the next country. And it was completely unfair to her. Like it was an unhealthy balance because things were always revolving around my career and going to the next country and things like that. And so ultimately uh, we went our separate ways. And now that I'm dating someone who's also kind of like uh, running their own business per se, or has their own um, independent lifestyle they have to run, it's just, you can see eye to eye that much more because you just understand that it's like, there's nobody that's waking me up in the morning saying, hey, bro, get to work. Like it's, it's either I do it or I don't make any money type thing. And so she understands that much more and, and it makes like the separation time or the travel time or you know, when we're so tired, but we got to vlog this dinner when we'd rather just kind of sit there and go like this. It just makes it that much more understanding when, when you have someone that thinks in a similar like um, mindset. Yeah, I, wow. I, I agree with that because like I've had like obviously not as much uh, experience as you in this situation, but like I've had a small taste in those both sides. And yeah, I, I don't I don't really like someone just constantly being attached to yeah. the way I'm living. And Plus the extra time that you get between each other, it's just so relieving. Because exactly. Adi also mentioned like you feel a sense of freedom, and you do want that, and you want the person to also want to feel that way as well. Because if you're just constantly around each other, it's it's not going to be as interesting. The relationship is going to die down kind of quickly. Like my 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 from the, the, the relationships that I've watched and observed from my friends and from people around the world. Um, I feel like after the one year mark, it just starts to, it needs a lot of work after the first year mark. Cause like obviously up to one year, you're still going, you're going through the honeymoon phase. You're learning about each other, still love it, you know, taking care of each other and all that. Um, but then after the one year mark, it starts to feel a bit different, starting to get used to each other. And you guys are basically a, kind of sick of each other at a certain point. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> they, they call that the the ending of the honeymoon phase. You know, somewhere mm-hmm. between twelve and eighteen months is uh, is what they say. The worst that's, phase. That's, yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. They say if you can make it through that, then you know your your relationship can survive. But I mean, that's that is a very very true point. You know, like after after you kind of get through the phase of knowing each other and all that excitement and then you're just constantly with people that's that's when you have to start really putting in work if you love that person like i mean mm-hmm. it's not going to be like flowers and rainbows i don't care any relationship you see on instagram in the world they always are dealing with <laughs> something not always but they have they deal with their own problems you know sometimes social media makes people think that like you know, some of these perfect relationships exist, but like, there is no such thing as perfection. You know, people, everyone has their imperfections, but you just got to find that person who, you know, those imperfections are worth, you know, fighting through, you know, and, uh, working through, let's say not fighting through (laughs) debating through. And so, (laughs) and so, I mean, that's, that's kind of like the reality, uh, of, of, uh, of dating when you're constantly in the same city. And that is one of the, I would say pros to having a long-term relationship is uh, sorry, not long-term long distance relationship because you, you just have that like on and off 
uh, honeymoon phase again whenever you're away from each other for that week. You know, just those those days leading up to you're like, oh my god, I can't wait to see you, and then those days you're actually with them and everything, and then you leave again, and then you come back, and it kind of just repeats. So it is it is a really nice and uh, exciting way to keep kind of that spark going long term because we've known each other like 14 months now. So uh, you know, we weren't like officially dating the entire time, but we've been kind of uh, <laughs> we've been kind of hanging out for for pretty much the entire 14 months now, and so we still kind of have that spark very strong when you know fly out and then fly back to see each other. Yeah, that's amazing. So it is sweet. definitely. <laughs> and so there's two points actually I want to go into. First of all, uh, that I I want to yeah. ask. You're you're a travel vlogger. You you you're always traveling. You're constantly moving around, and there's obviously a wear and tear on uh, on the person physically and mentally over the constant mm-hmm. movement and switching time zones and all of that. How do you see yourself like going forward? Is this gonna be constantly be your YouTube content? Is it always gonna be traveling, or is it gonna adapt? And how is it going to adapt? Also, you always eat milkshakes. You always eat ice cream. I've never seen you eat anything healthy on your show. Lebanese (laughs) belly. Lebanese belly. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, yeah. Yeah, Oh, my gosh. I I blame Lebanon for this. Trust me. I blame Lebanon fully for this. Because everyone... (laughs) Yeah, yeah. It's literally Kiliom every single day in Lebanon. Whenever I'm with the families there, they're always like, eat more, eat more, eat more. And I'm like, deal. <laughs> and, there's bre- and there's bread with everything. That's the problem. <laughs> literally everything. Yeah, yeah. But that's honestly, it's such a good question. Like all of the travel vloggers I know, we all go through this. That like, I mean, after a long time on the road, and my dad actually, my dad's a photographer when he was... um when he was like uh probably like 25 or something he traveled but not all all around the world just all around the u.s like for months at a time and so when i first started traveling he was just he told me like all these things that i've learned by doing which is like if you're always spending time with someone you're gonna get sick of them whether it's a romantic or platonic relationship give them your space he also told me like just keep in mind when you're traveling long term sometimes you lose yourself and like all these things have come true in in different ways but they are manageable but i would say when it comes to like yeah, like traveling for three years. I mean, there's some on and off points, right? Like the pandemic happened. But after a long time, you the biggest thing, like when you travel and you see so many things, you just find the more um, and it's at no fault to any country. But you just find that like every single country sees the world in their own way when the world is truly completely different than any country even sees it. Right. Like mm-hmm. you're born into this uh, identity. Like I was born into being an American in Wisconsin, you know, um, in a hundred thousand person town where some people do travel, but like a lot of people, you know, stay in the U.S. And so their um, their understanding of the world is is limited to what they're surrounded by, right? And that's the same in every city and every country in the world because you you are the product of your environment. And I have found that the more countries I go to, the more I understand how different the world actually is than what I've understood it, what I grew up thinking it was like. There's, of course, some parts that have I found to be completely accurate, but there's also some parts where I found that it's so, so different from what like your uh, you just learn growing up, what your surroundings are, what the media tells you that, uh, you know, now I, I see the world in the way that I do. And I see so much good, so much more good in the world than I see bad. But like a lot of the world doesn't realize that, you know? And so there's a lot of times where I feel I fit into so many countries yet. I don't fit into any single one. If you understand what I mean, like, because a lot of travelers will say this, like when you go to so many places, you start to like crush a lot of these stereotypes. Then you get to a new place where they have this new stereotype and they don't see it in the same way. And, uh, do you kind of get what I mean by that? Yeah, but I kind of disagree on certain on the one point where you were saying like, okay, so it's different. Obviously, yeah, when you travel around the world, it's like you're gonna see different perspectives. But for me, I feel like so you know how you everyone wants to believe that they're unique in some ways, and uh, <laughs> I mean, yeah, it makes okay, yeah, you have like certain situations where you're different that make you different as a person, like you look mm-hmm. different. But then you see like other examples where, for example, you look like a bunch of other people because like that's yeah. how it works. And 
people actually think the same way, even if they're, you know, from different regions in the world. But it's just like labeled differently. And okay, I'll give you this like certain culture, they might have like, you know, a different dance or a different food. Or, right. But in essence, like the general, the general theme tends to be very similar wherever you go around the world. It's like the love Definitely. for your country or the love for your, your relationships, um, the way you, you show your emotions. All of these tend to be pretty similar. The general themes tend to be very the same. Um, so how, so what, what is like the really different from what, uh, what you were saying? Yes. So I probably did not explain it perfectly because I completely agree with you that the more places I go, the more you find that, uh, how similar the world is. Mm -hmm. And that's what I mean in terms of like most of the world, 99% of the world is incredibly nice and generous and good and trusting people. But you're you're born into societies where because there's political tension between, let's say, America and X country, you think that every single person in that country is bad. Like right now, probably a lot of the world thinks all of Russia is very bad uh, because, you know, the Russian politics are doing this. There's a lot of amazing people inside of Russia right now. Of course, it's a bit harder for people to swallow that right now when they're bringing out nuclear bombs. But there's a lot of people in those places that you find don't want war. They don't want that, you know, and this is more what I mean that. I have found that most of the world you can find commonalities you can but they're they're culturally unique in their own unique foods dances and this but everyone wants love everyone wants happiness everyone wants to be able to put food on the table for their loved ones right like that's a, that's common what I more mean is that like I I was born as an American and so when I was in America I fit in as an American in the American lifestyle yeah. and then now yeah. that I'm so culturally um diversified and i'm saying this in a very like humble way i'm so grateful to say this that sometimes i feel like i fit into every culture because i love adapting into the local culture but then because i'm so adaptable i almost feel like wait, which culture do i even fit in like in terms mm -hmm. of where could i actually see myself settling down because i don't full i don't feel like um uh, I don't always feel like I fully fit in as an American now because there's just so many ways I see the world differently now. And I, I'm trying to say this. It's like a, uh, like a, almost a, a funny moment for me rather than like a negative yeah. thing, if you get what I mean. Mm -hmm. But do you fit in in America? Like if you when you go back, do you still fit in as you used to? Or, is, or do you feel like you've maybe adopted a nomad uh, lifestyle? I, I would say probably like in the very because i've lived in a few places around the u.s and i would say generally i mean i've sometimes you go back to places and you think that the people there have changed but then you realize actually you might have been the one that have changed yeah and exactly. just some of the experiences the way i see the world has has probably changed me in in many ways right uh, not probably it definitely has and so, you know, sometimes people remember you in a different version of you, right? Like you knew them 10 years ago, they knew you as this maybe college student and, you know, different motives then, right? And now, right. you know, my motives have been more like breaking stereotypes around the world and, you know, bringing cultures together and making content to showcase that. And so I'm a much different version of who I once was. And so I still think that I fully fit in as an American, uh, definitely. But I think there's just some things like, it doesn't matter where you're from. If you're like uh, trying to explain something that people haven't necessarily experienced themselves, sometimes you can have a challenge trying to explain that scenario to them because they just firsthand haven't experienced it themselves. And sometimes when I'm telling stories on like uh, these places I've been, you know, there's there's stereotypes on like just why are you even there in the first place rather than like, oh, it was such an amazing cultural moment, right? And uh, those are those are some of the like maybe disconnection moments that I'll have with mm -hmm. people that were in previous chapters of my life, if that makes sense. Well, people don't usually travel, you know, it's like especially in America, it's <laughs> very few people have the opportunity to travel internationally. Um, yeah, they could if they wanted to. But, you know, it's just that their people are just so used to the routine. And then um, you definitely fit in in America, but it sounds like you're starting to fit in in other places too. And now you become like, oh, you're a global citizen, you know, where we can exactly. fit in here, we can fit in there. You can joke with people here. You can understand the humor there. And like, you know, it's, uh, I feel like that's a much more freeing thing because you're not tied down to any one place in my opinion, because if something happens in Lebanon, you're like, okay, 
back to Wisconsin or to Oman or to yeah, Mexico yeah. or something. You know what I mean? It's definitely like the next pandemic happens, you're like, okay, <laughs> I'm exactly. going, you know, whatever. Exactly. Yeah, the chillest places. And like, um, is that why it's important for you to learn languages? I'm curious as to like why you're like, I always see that you're trying to like speak languages from wherever you're at. Um, yeah. How did that start? And um, is that because you're trying to fit in? Yeah, really good question. I would say when it comes to learning languages, I mean, I'm literally probably only fluent in English, but I try and learn, you know, a handful of words in every country that I go to. And, you know, any country that I'm expecting to spend more and more time in or region, then I'll then I'll really put some uh, effort on it like I have for Arabic. But I have found that um, uh, two things. One, it's it's just enjoyable to see people's reactions when you know a couple words in their local language. And like probably the most important reason is uh, when you go to a new country and you learn some of the local language, even if they all speak English or know enough to get by uh, the locals, they appreciate it. They're like, wow, this person really put in some effort to learn a bit more about my culture rather than coming in as maybe like a vacationing tourist that, you know, isn't as interested in learning a bit about them. Right. And so yeah. I found, especially in, in, places that aren't as uh, commonly visited, Lebanon and Pakistan mm -hmm. and, you know, some of these places that don't get a massive amount of like foreign tourism. You go there, they're already maybe somewhat a bit shocked to see, uh, you know, some foreigners that don't have any relation to this country there. And then on top of that, they're even more excited when you can say a couple words like, you know, you drop a key fuck on them and they're like, whoa, you speak <laughs> Arabic. And I'm like, well, I just said, how are you? But they're just loving it. <laughs> No, those those small those small little moments honestly just add to the excitement in the day when you're traveling around and just makes makes those moments that much more connected with the local. I see. Yeah, it's like a it's a nice surprise, you know. You just like end up when you just say something in their language and you're saying it correctly as well. It's yeah. just like that's it. It breaks the tension between the the language barrier that's usually there, and they also think. In their in their head because like for me if if i met a foreigner and just randomly started speaking arabic to me fluently i'd be like oh that's 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 pretty good man that's great i don't actually yeah. I, although i speak english fluently i but let's say if it was a german or a spanish person or something like that and they're speaking arabic fluently i'll be like great i don't have the problem of communicating with this person and yeah, yeah. people feel just more comfortable when they're able to communicate with the other person it leaves you know less margin of error between uh, mm -hmm. between the two and there's no misunderstandings that's happening because yeah misunderstandings can lead to a few issues exactly yeah yeah it's so true exactly you, you hit the nail on the head right there that it's it just adds to that comfort level you know like the the more you can associate with someone's comfort zone which is their local language right or their local cuisine or whatever is local to them, you know, the more you're going to be able to connect with them because they're going to be like, you're going to find a commonality that you can have a conversation on or, you know, something to spark some interest. Oh, you know, how'd you learn Arabic or how do you know about this, you know, local dish or whatever it might be. And that, that, you know, can really bring you together with a complete stranger in such a short period of time. Um, yeah. Uh, last question because we're wrapping up your time, <laughs> but I want to ask you, um, how important is it to follow trends? How much do you study the trends within the travel blogging community? Because um, what are some trends? Uh, partying, <laughs> you know, <laughs> partying around the world. Is that part of you or is that part of a trend? Also, like, um, have you thought about like um, uh, van life and stuff like that and having a van and traveling around in that as opposed to? And uh, one more, like uh, having a baby. That seems like something all the travel bloggers are doing right now. So, what, how much do you study trends and uh, um, what are your thoughts on it? Yeah. Oh, oh, that's a bunch of good questions. So when it comes to trends, <laughs> you know, it probably depends per platform. Like where I see trends the most would be on TikTok. I, and because TikTok's not much of a revenue stream for me. I don't really focus too much on the trends. However, I would say a better way to explain it would be I follow world events. So for example, uh, the Dubai Expo happened in February, uh, sorry, last year, right? 
And so I was there in February 2021 and I made a full YouTube series because I knew there was going to be a tremendous amount of visitors to Dubai, which means there was going to be increased search traffic. And so that's what I, that's why I was just in Qatar right uh, six weeks before the World Cup. World Cup. I just filmed an entire tourism series. And so when people search Qatar, by the end of October, there'll be 17 videos or something that I've released on Qatar. And I'll be able to kind of dominate that search traffic as more people are planning their trip to go to the World Cup. And so those are more of like the trends that I personally follow. I don't want to say trends are a bad thing. I just see them probably the most... Yeah, the most commonly on like Reels or TikTok. And it's just about a year ago, TikTok and uh, not as much Reels, but TikTok was big for me, right? It was a, a pretty big revenue stream. And so I did follow some like travel trends on, you know, snap your fingers and transition to this place. But yeah. now that it's just not really a revenue driver, it hasn't been as much of a uh, focus point. But I don't want to tell people that that's a bad thing. Like, you know, if you're starting out and you're trying to get your TikTok account going or just get your name out there, finding a trend and, you know, getting getting some proper traction to your video, getting those views and those new followers is so worth it. You know, growth isn't just about revenue. It's about building your brand and, um, you know, TikTok and Reels are an incredibly amazing platform for getting your name out there. And so now on the other questions here, so we had trends and then we had something and then we had the baby. What was number two? <laughs> I was asking about um, party lifestyle, uh, mm-hmm. living in a van, the van life and uh, van life, right. baby. Those are like on YouTube even. They're like kind of the big travel vlogger trends right now. Yeah. Well, yeah. What's your yeah. reaction? <laughs> so van, yeah, van life is, uh, is one that I kind of did, I guess, back in. 2019 sorry 2020 january 2020 right before the pandemic i did do like a a bit of van life for like 17 days around new zealand and it was like a lot of fun however i feel like that's a that's pretty niche these days Mm. but maybe if i was like going around like europe for like three months maybe i'd get a van and do that (laughs) and and follow that trend i haven't yet but it is, it is nice to kind of just do a series that that is a bit more focused on it. When it comes to partying, I would say it's probably more country by country. You know, if I'm going to Ibiza, it's necessary to make a party vlog, you know, going to one of the <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, but when I'm in some of these other countries in the Middle East uh, that don't have as much of the party scene, maybe I'll include having a beer at a, at a hotel, but it won't be as much of of a focus point but the challenge is when you're when you're going to parties as a youtuber they're always playing uh you know top music right and top music is going to be smacking you in the face with copyright so you can't monetize those videos so i don't really film that much partying unless it's on like an insta story or like uh tiktok or a reel but rarely on youtube just because you have to do so much more editing to take that to you know extract that original sound out of the uh, video and then you know you have to do more editing pick out a non-copyrighted song add it in there so it makes it a bit more challenging but for the right country definitely i'm tossing that in there <laughs> now i'll invite you a- to one of my parties and i'll only play copyright free music so then you can like uh, <laughs> i love that <laughs> perfect yeah, actually that's a great idea <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. And so now the, the, the drum roll question now, <laughs> well, I'm going to answer this question now and now I'm going to go knock on wood. Cause I feel like I'm going to jinx myself. But, uh, yeah, as of now, uh, I'm not aware of any, uh, of any plans that, uh, me and Sahab there having any children anytime soon. So right now, right now, lo- not looking to chase down that trend, but you know, if, uh, <laughs> if the universe, uh, prefers to have that in my plan, then, you know, that's, that could be something in the future for sure at some point, but yeah, I mean, the the thing is, is when you change your trend or your your niche that much, you're basically going from like a travel vlogger uh, to a family vlogger, and then you have a bit of a new audience you're going to be focused on. So I probably need to start. I probably need to uh, consider how I would go down that avenue. But uh, yeah, as of now, no plans for the baby. <laughs> <laughs> All right, <laughs> Said, last question. <laughs> um to be honest that was actually one of the questions i wanted to ask previously when i said there was two points to make because i wanted to know how your content is going to adapt with the inclusion of your girlfriend and obviously if there's going to be a family in the future how are you 
how are you gonna switch from travel uh, blogger to you know something else how's your content gonna adapt yeah i would say already i mean the i think the best way to put it is that when you're a solo vlogger like i was or maybe i would be with other vloggers and some of them yeah your focus is a bit different right you're walking around the city your your attention is a hundred percent either in the place you're in or talking to the camera right and yeah. i was actually talking to uh mabel about this uh the other day because you know once in a while you'll get some comments that'll say like oh we missed max vlogs when uh it was just him <laughs> and then other comments will be like they love having they they love having the um uh the extra enjoyment or the extra like I guess uh compatibility. Wow, look at that. I swear she can hear. She can hear guys. The whole podcast was about you, by the way. Uh what? What? Yes, the whole podcast where he was talking about you and like how he wants to have a child with you in the future and stuff like that. You hear that? She said, Yeah, Borne. Yeah, Borne. He is nice to meet you, my brother. Keeper. <laughs> nice to meet you too. Let's He's go. Beautiful guy. sunset. Yeah, you guys should yeah. go and sunset. This beautiful yeah. sunset. This, this is a great way to end the podcast, man. <laughs> With uh, love uh, and like uh, and travel and all that. Yeah. Go follow <laughs> yeah. World Nomac. Link in the bio. Uh, subscribe. Can we get a subscribe from you guys? Yeah. All right. Subscribe. Yo, thank you very subscribe. much. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Anyway, this is how we end. Salute to the podcast. Uh, to all the right. Camera. Adios, yeah. amigos. <laughs> ah.